The joint hearing of the Subcommittee on Environment and the Subcommittee on Energy will come to order. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's joint hearing entitled EPA's Power Plant Regulations. Is the technology ready? In front of each member are packets containing the written testimony, biographies, and truth and testimony disclosures for today's witnesses. Before we get started, uh, since this is a joint hearing involving two subcommittees, I want to explain how we will operate procedurally so all members will understand how the question and answer period will be handled. After first recognizing the chair and the ranking members of the Environment and Energy Subcommittees, we will recognize those members present at the gavel in order of seniority of the full committee, and those coming in after the gavel will be recognized in order of their arrival. And just as a side note, um, we had a Republican conference this, uh, conference this morning. That's going a little bit long. We expect other members to be joining us shortly. And in the event that uh, Ms. Loomis and others are not here for their opening comments, we will allow them to, uh, to have that time allocated to them for their comments upon their arrival. I now recognize myself for five minutes for opening statement then. I'd like to thank the witnesses for being here today. I've had the chance to introduce myself and to, uh, to meet you, and we appreciate uh, your time and, and your sacrifice in attending with us. And we have an excellent panel before us, but I am disappointed that EPA didn't accept our invitation to join us, and perhaps Ms. McCabe will be able to join us in the future on the hearing on this topic. The significance of EPA's proposed new source performance standards for new power plants just simply can't be understated. As the first GHG standards for the statutory sources under the Clean Air Act, the rule does more than affect power plants. It sets the benchmark for standards affecting all industries, standards that will touch every aspect of our economy. And most troubling, however, is the proposal appears to be based on a hypothetical plant. And this is a very dangerous precedent. Under the Clean Air Act, setting the standards is basically a three-step process. First, establish the universe of adequately demonstrated technology. Second, determine an achievable level based upon that technology. And then third, we consider the cost. In its proposal, EPA conveniently skips over step one. It then heavily focuses its analysts uh, on modeling scenarios that project the answers to step two and three. These model-only based arguments are outlandish to experts and engineers and to the general public. We don't need to look further than the botched out rollout of the healthcare.gov to appreciate the consequences of disregarding testing of a full scale product. But EPA thinks it can get away with this due primarily, I think, to its, the court's deference. But the focus of this hearing and the first question the EPA must answer is not what standards do we set or even is this cost prohibitive Instead, our hearing today focuses only on step one, and that is, is the technology ready? This question exposes the soft underbelly of the rule. When the facts and experts make clear the technology is not ready, there is no need to model emissions level or ask economists to make projections. To be clear, EPA relies on DOE modeling to conduct their an analysis. And this is how they circumvent the step one, is it ready question. They simply assume that it is ready and then they plow ahead. The model is only as good as the assumptions that go into it. Even a critical design review cannot account for irregular behavior in a full scale product. Take for example, the first Tacoma Narrows Bridge. Everything appeared to be operational until a 40 mile an hour wind toppled what was the third longest sus suspension bridge in the world. Here, because the technology isn't ready, all of EPA's subsequent claims are purely hypothetical. Its claims are mere conjecture that ignores the fact that in DOE's words, the technology is unproven. After the agency has finished looking at its crystal ball, analyzing an imaginary world, it tries to justify its claims of adequate demonstration with weak post hoc citations to cherry pick literature the experiences with vastly scaled down technology components and power plants that are under construction. In order to comply with the EPA's rule, carbon capture and sequestration is required. CCS, as it's commonly known, is not one piece of equipment. Rather, it's a complicated system of many separate technologies. Each piece of this chain, which includes capture, compression, transportation, and sequestration, must work in a seamlessly integrated fashion on a full-scale power plant. No CCS project in the world meets this criteria. 
In its proposed rule, EPA points to several examples of fledging CCS projects as proof that the technology is adequately demonstrated. But let's take a look at some of those examples. If you could look to the uh, screen, here are a few examples of the Texas Summit Clean Energy Project, which in the EPA's words is, quote, under construction. My favorite picture, which is coming up, is at the bottom of the project's webpage, small common grave by train tracks in Penwell. Actually, this is the only CCS currently occurring on the site. Emissions modeling and economic projections based on a hypothetical plant are irrelevant. EPA's rule won't be implemented in a fairy tale world. This rule will affect real power plants and real people. This hearing is about what unicorns, Bigfoot, and the adequately demonstrated CCS for power plants all have in common. They are mere figments of the imagination. Talk of emission levels and cost based on hypothetical modeling scenario is just a bunch of noise, a distraction from the fact that technology isn't ready. EPA attempts to lawyer its way around this fact, but ultimately EPA cannot paper over the truth to quote John Adams, facts are stubborn things. I look forward to our experts' discussion uh, today on this step one question, is the technology ready? And with that, I now recognize the ranking member, Ms. Bonamici, for her opening statement. Thank you very much, Chairman Stewart and Chair Lummis, for holding this hearing today. And to our panel, welcome to the Committee on Science, Space, and Technology. I join those who are pleased by the proposal from the administration and the United States Environmental Protection Agency to take the first steps to set carbon emission limits for all future natural gas and coal power plants. We've known for some time that dangerously high levels of carbon dioxide pollution are altering our planet's climate system. According to the latest statistics compiled by the EPA, American power plants released more than 2.4 billion tons of carbon dioxide into the environment in 2011. Fossil fuel power plants are responsible for a majority of these emissions, and coal-fired power plants emit more carbon dioxide than any other source. Last month, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released the Global Comprehensive Scientific Assessment confirming that it is extremely likely that human influence has been the dominant cause of the observed warming since the mid-20th century. The report also confirmed that carbon dioxide increases are primarily the result of fossil fuel emissions and have increased by 40 percent since the pre-industrial period. Addressing the effects of carbon pollution globally will require an, an international effort, but the United States can and must be a leader and set an example for other nations by reducing our carbon pollution at home. We must do a better job of preventing the harmful effects of carbon dioxide emissions produced by natural gas and coal-fired power plants. The coal industry's claim that the new carbon rule will kill jobs and bring down a recovering economy are scare tactics that have no basis in reality. The EPA proposal will not apply to existing power plants. The new rule will only apply to new coal-fired power plants that will be built in the future. As we look forward to the EPA issuing the new carbon emission standard, it's worth reminding ourselves of what we get with these standards. Better air quality, which means better health for us, for our children, and for our grandchildren. In the four decades since it was signed, the Clean Air Act has saved thousands of lives and helped fuel job growth. Additionally, and importantly, the passage of the Clean Air Act led to innovative advancements in technology. Environmental protection technology industries created innovations like catalytic converters and sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxide control technology. When the EPA took steps to require the application of these technologies, the industry made claims against those rules similar to the contentions that the coal industry is using today to undermine the carbon emission standard for new fossil fuel power plants that our economy would be weakened and the industry would be devastated, and as we know, that did not come to fruition. Those industries adjusted and incorporated the technologies into their operations and went on to be more profitable than they had been. And we got cleaner air and healthier children. The future of our planet and our environment depends on us making smart investments in innovative environmental protection technologies and reducing the amount of greenhouse gases we emit into our environment. 
The new EPA rule under the Clean Air Act will incentivize the development of these technologies that will in turn result in a safer, more secure, and less carbon-dependent energy future. And before I close, Mr. S uh, Chair, I wanted to um, clarify, it's my understanding uh, that according to the EPA, they did offer to appear at a hearing in November. They were unable to appear today because once the government reopened after the shutdown, which, as you know, lasted more than a couple of weeks, they did not have enough time to prepare for today with the backlog from the shutdown. So I don't think they intended not to show. They did not get an invitation until September 27th, immediately before the shutdown. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to the uh, uh, testimony and the answers to our questions, and I yield back. Uh, thank you, Ms. Fonamici. And, and we, uh, regardless of, uh, of the reasons why we do look forward to uh, subsequent conversations with the EPA, and we ex anticipate that they will be accommodating to us at that point. Uh, the Chair now recognizes the Chairwoman of the Subcommittee on Energy, Ms. Lummis, for her opening statement. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member. Good morning. Um, and thank you, witnesses, for joining us at today's hearing on carbon capture and storage technology. I do wish the EPA was here today at least to listen to our concerns. And I consider an uh, invitation extended on September 27th for a hearing uh, that is occurring about a month later to be pretty good time. Uh, to prepare, especially since it is their own rules uh, that we're asking them to defend. The EPA has proposed new source performance standards for any future coal-fired power plant. These standards can be achieved only through the application of carbon capture and storage, a technology that is not currently in operation at a commercial scale power plant anywhere in the world. Instead of basing these requirements on technology that are actually proven achievable on a commercial scale, EPA is redefining and stretching the requirement that technology be adequately demonstrated. This leaves many unanswered questions. Will the carbon capture technology function as intended when installed in full-scale plants? Is the pipeline infrastructure available for transportation on a large scale? And what is the liability for storage of carbon dioxide over the long term? EPA ignores many of these questions as the rule only impacts future coal plants. The Obama administration has spent much of the past few years casting coal as a villain. This regulation effectively bans the building of new coal plants and fulfills President Obama's campaign promise to bankrupt coal companies. But this hearing is not only about the proposed regulation. It is also about a legal precedent of mandating unproven technologies. The distinction the agency makes between coal and natural gas plants is dubious at best. By claiming that carbon capture technology is adequately demonstrated for coal, there is scant justification, legal or technical, for not requiring it for natural gas units. If EPA is allowed to twist the definition of adequately demonstrated to include yet to be proven technologies for power plants, there's also little time, excuse me, there's also little to stop EPA from doing the same for other manufacturers like refiners, cement, or steel plants. Not only would this throw our economy into a tailspin, it would force manufacturers to flee to countries with less restrictive environmental requirements, costing jobs and increasing global emissions. Coal is our country's most abundant and affordable energy source. Thanks to the deployment of proven technologies, its production is much safer and environmentally sound. And the Clean Air Act, the Clean Air Act has worked. It has produced cleaner air every year since it was passed. Coal is not only our country's most abundant and affordable energy source, uh, one that the President is making clear that his goal is to apply standards to existing plants as well, thereby making it difficult for existing plants to stay in business. This policy of picking winners and losers, of saying we're going to have wind and solar energy, but not fossil fuel energy or nuclear energy, even though those are the only ones sufficient to create baseload, is reckless. And it's dangerous for our country if we want to advance economically and create jobs and return to a sound economy. I continue to support an all-of-the-above energy policy, not one based on politics. And all-of-the-above means all-of-the-above, including 
fossil fuel and including wind and solar. From an economic outlook, none of this should be taken lightly. Affordable, reliable electricity is the backbone of a healthy economy. Rising electricity prices affect everything, the cost of basic commodities like food, to our competitive position in the world. And because increasing energy prices are like a regressive tax, they hit the poor and those on fixed incomes the hardest. Just ask any single mother who pulls up to a gas station when the price of gasoline uh, hovers near four bucks. America cannot afford to allow EPA edicts to control our energy policy. These new regulations will make life harder for working families, for single moms struggling to get by, and for anyone who lives paycheck to paycheck. This is something we should be guarding against not encouraging. I look forward to the hearing. I look forward to this panel of witnesses. I want to hear you discuss developments of this technology, its potential, as well as its limitations. I also want to understand the impact this rule could have on future advances in carbon capturing and also conversion of coal to liquids and other opportunities that create a cleaner future for our country while enjoying and utilizing our ingenuity and our abundant coal resources. If you really want to see whether somebody's affected by coal, I strongly encourage you uh, to go out around 12.30 on the west front of the Capitol today. There's an American Energy Jobs Rally. Uh, there are coal miners uh, and the companies they serve here on the Capitol steps. And if you think that uh, it's not going to matter, or whether you can pass regulations that uh, the technology is unproven but will suddenly appear uh, and the prices won't go up and the coal plants will continue to be built and those jobs will still exist, try listening to the people on the Capitol steps here today uh, who, who will prove you wrong with their real life stories. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Ms. Lamas. The, the chair now recognizes the ranking member of the Subcommittee on Energy, Mr. Swalwell, for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Stewart and Chairman Lamas, for holding this hearing. I look forward to working with our witnesses today. Uh, I do have to say I, I think it's unfair, uh, Mr. Chairman, to accuse the EPA of not accepting the invitation to be here today. That invitation was extended uh, right before the shutdown, and they have offered to appear in November. I look forward to having them here. But you can't turn off the power and then complain that no one answered the phone. And that's what I think is happening right here. And uh, I think that's an unfair uh, way to start this hearing. Uh, global climate change, though, is one of the greatest challenges that we face. And last month, the in Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released a report which states with 95 percent certainty that human activities are responsible for climate change. This report was based on a rigorous review of thousands of scientific papers published by over 800 of the world's top scientists. The report also makes it clear that if we do not take steps to halt this damage and make this change, the repercussions of, for humans and the environment will be catastrophic. We need to move forward and take the necessary steps to combat the warning of warming of our planet before these impacts become inevitable. We know that humans are impacting the climate in a number of ways, through emissions from the vehicles we drive, deforestation, and changes in agricultural practices, among other things. But fossil-based fuel power plants are the biggest producers of greenhouse gases, accounting for rough, roughly a third of our total emissions last year. I have repeatedly said, just as Chairman Lummis has, that I favor an all-of-the-above approach to energy production. As I often say, if we can make it safe, let's make it happen. But I have to make it clear that we must take steps to make sure that we are reducing greenhouse gas emissions and lessening their impact on human health, the environment, and global change. This is exactly what the proposed standards for new coal and natural burning gases aim to do, which is why I support their implementation. And like Ms. Bonamici, I want to reinforce that they will have no effect on existing plants. So we aren't going to see a wave of shuttered plants and massive layoffs as a result of their implementation. And if we can display the first slide, 
the slide number one that's going to be displayed shows all of the existing power, all of the existing coal plants in the United States, approximately 600 of them. Slide two is a map of the United States, and it has on it all of the plants that are affected by these new standards. You don't need a magnifying glass to see that the number is zero. Zero plants are affected by these standards. Zero jobs today will be lost by these new standards, and I think it's important not uh, to confuse the issue here. There are in-depth discussions underway about establishing standards for existing plants, which the EPA currently plans to propose next June, and there are ongoing extensive engagement with all of the stakeholders to make sure that these standards will be flexible and won't have negative effects on state economies and job creation. I think we also cannot discount the value of certainty. The fact that there was uncertainty in what the regulations were going to be was also affecting uh, job creation in existing plants and plans for new plants. And now that we have standards, uh, that lends certainty uh, to the marketplace. Uh, finally, there's nobody I know in Congress who intentionally wants to destroy or kill a job. I think what we want to do here is to make sure that we have healthy air for our children to breathe, a healthy future, and mitigate the effects on the economy to the best degree uh, possible. But if you want to count job killing by the numbers, the cost of the government shutdown for 16 days, 120,000 jobs, $24 billion to our economy. There's no policy that we can create today or that the EPA has created today that will kill as many jobs as that or wreak as much havoc on our economy as that government shutdown. And I think if we want to compare the two, uh, that uh, is a stark, stark contrast. Uh, finally, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle often say that our children and grandchildren will be left holding the bag if we do not, receive, if we do not reduce our deficits and national debt, something I uh, greatly agree with them about. But I think similarly, Future generations will be the ones who will suffer if we do not take important and meaningful steps to confront climate change. But in this case, in this case, as the global scientific community has made clear again and again, the consequences of our inaction will be much, much more severe. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Swalwell. Um, very quickly, uh, we understand that there's differences of opinion, so we can discuss or argue among ourselves whether the EPA had adequate time. Some of us feel that they did. Uh, others may disagree with that. Uh, what's really clear is that in a, in a pattern that's been established for more than just this hearing, but for, frankly, for as long as I've sat in this chair, we have had to struggle to get them to come and to participate in many of our hearings. And this is, a, uh, this is just another example of that. But as I said earlier, we look forward to working with them and getting their representatives to come and meet with us. Uh, with that, then, we will now turn to the uh, chairman of the full committee, Chairman Smith, for his opening statement. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today's hearing will allow us to hear from top experts in energy and environmental fields and examine important technical issues associated with EPA's new power plant regulations. In the regulatory process, it is often difficult to separate technical issues from legal issues. And the technology question we focus on here today is also ultimately a legal question. If you take a look at the EPA's rule on air quality standards, the proposal looks more like a legal brief than a rule about protecting the air. It appears the EPA is up to an old legal trick. If you can't win the argument on the merits, start arguing about the definition of words. In this proposal, the EPA redefines the law to accommodate its ever-expanding regulatory agenda. By redefining what the term adequately demonstrated means in the Clear Air Act, the EPA is making another major power grab, one that reaches well beyond coal. That's because the new source performance standards for power plants is the first greenhouse gas standard under the Clean Air Act. Consequently, it sets the precedent for all other sources and underpins everything from the price we pay at the pump to the cost of electricity and food. If the EPA continues to play fast and loose with the law, we can expect to see more costly, heavy-handed rules that risk jobs and economic growth. Working families will bear these costs. 
Even more troubling is the way this proposal appears to intentionally block the courts from reviewing the rule. By claiming that no one will build coal-fired power plants anyway, the EPA wants to prevent the courts from reviewing the rule on its merits. Our founders recognized that elections alone may not provide adequate protection for the liberties they fought so hard to establish. They made sure that the Constitution provides a means for the American people to obtain a fair hearing before impartial judges. One of the most underrated rights Americans enjoy today may be the right to judicial review. This proposal is an attempt to prevent judicial review. Americans deserve to understand exactly what this proposal would do and retain the right to challenge it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before you go back, let me apologize at the outset. I have a, another committee that is in the middle of marking up legislation that I'll need to uh, go to, and another committee is also having a hearing, so I'll be shuttling back and forth. But appreciate that you're holding this hearing. It's a very, very important one. Yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and you're welcome to participate as much as you can. Okay. Thank you. Uh, if there are members who wish to submit additional opening statements, your statements will be added to the record at this point. Uh, as our witnesses should know, spoken testimony is limited to five minutes, uh, after which members of the committee have five minutes each to ask you questions, and your written testimony will also be included in the record for the hearing, uh, re I'm sorry, record of the hearing. Uh, and I'd like now to introduce our uh, our witnesses today, and I will introduce, introduce you individually. We'll turn the time over to you for five minutes, then I'll introduce the next witness. Our first witness is the Honorable Charles McConnell, Executive Director at the Energy and Environment Initiative, Rice University. Previously, Mr. McConnell served as the second Assistant Secretary for Fossil Fuel at the U.S. Department of Energy. At DOE, he was responsible for the strategic policy, leadership budgets, project management, research and development of the department's coal, oil and gas and advanced technology programs and the National Energy Laboratories, uh, Technologies Laboratories. Prior to joining DOE, Mr. McConnell served as Vice President of the Carbon Management at Battelle Energy Technology. And Mr. McConnell, we turn the time over to you now for five minutes for your opening statement. Thank you. Uh, it's an honor to participate at this hearing and have the opportunity to have a fact-based discussion about the science of CCS technology. I might also add it's refreshing to prepare my remarks today without any OMB oversight. Uh -huh. Let me start by saying that we do have a problem. CO2 capture, utilization, and storage technology is a requirement to meet greenhouse gas standards. It's a requirement to meet new source performance standards, and it has not been commercially demonstrated at scale and cannot be deemed demonstrated technology. CCS is an environmental solution. It's an energy security issue, and it's also about economic competitiveness. All three of these things contribute to our success as a nation. CCS has the potential to make us stronger and more successful, as long as we don't forfeit that potential by rushing deployment of a technology that's not yet ready. The world is and will remain dependent for many decades to come with fossil fuels to provide low-cost, available, and reliable energy. The International Energy Agency has already projected that by 2050, the world's demand for energy will double. 1.7 billion people in the world today live in energy poverty. And yet by 2050, because we will need every single megawatt, megatherm, and energy source available to us, we'll still have 85% of our energy in the world provided by fossil fuels. So having fossil technology isn't an option, it's a requirement, as is an all of the above strategy. Commercial CCS technology is not available to meet the EPA's proposed rule. The cost of capture technology is much too high to be commercially viable, much the same as the economic threshold similar to subsidized carbon-free technology alternatives, such as solar, wind, etc. We're investing in all of the above across the board because it's critical to our future. In June, the administration released its Climate Action Plan a comprehensive program of domestic GHG emission reductions. The President's plan can only be achieved through the broad deployment of low-cost, commercially viable technology for capturing 
and permanently and safely storing CO2 from all fossil sources. But it's about energy security as well. CCS is necessary to assure a sustainable, diversified domestic energy portfolio for our energy security. It enables a true all-of-the-above energy portfolio. It's also a business strategy. CCS or CCUS, where the U means utilization of CO2 for purposes such as enhanced oil recovery, create a marketplace for implementation of these applications. It leads to broad deployment, and it also gives us a commercial and business background to bring that technology to the marketplace. CO2 EOR has been practiced in this country for over 50 years very successfully, and it includes the safe, long-term, permanent storage of CO2. But as I said, the technology isn't ready yet. The technology exists for separation and capture of CO2 at the plant, but it increases the cost of generated electricity by as much as 50 to 80 percent. And that depends on the power plant or the industrial application in which it's being used. CO2 pipeline and transmission systems are mature, but they face incredible siting difficulties for expansion of this marketplace. DOE's regional carbon sequestration partnerships must continue to develop the needed database to help analyze the success of this deployment. And of course, the injection of CO2 faces regulatory barriers as well. Unresolved property rights, long-term liability issues, all of the issues that in many cases the EPA is very involved in and needs to be supportive of to allow this technology to move, to move forward. But the technology is being demonstrated. It's successfully deployed in some early first-of-a-kind projects, but it's clearly not ready. It's really that simple. Focusing other questions are hypothetical, but not about the demonstrated results of these plants or projects or the technology associated with it. The technology can be made ready over time and will have to have the support of the EPA as well as the marketplace and industry. To summarize, in my opinion, it's disingenuous to state that the technology is ready and at the same time starve the R&D programs for our nation's energy security, global competitiveness, or our global leadership in terms of economic performance. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Our second witness today is Dr. Richard Bajuru, Director of the National Research Center for Coal and Energy at West Virginia University. And Dr. Did I, did I pronounce your name correctly? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. He has spent the past 21 years facilitating research programs in energy at West Virginia University, and during this time he developed and managed eight major interdisciplinary and interinstitutional research programs addressing a wide range of energy applications from research extraction to alternative fuels. And, Doctor, we turn the time over to you now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for inviting me. I consider coal to be a valuable resource, and I believe we should maintain technology options to keep it as part of our energy future. As proposed, I think the EPA regulations will stifle coal's continued involvement. I will summarize my comments in terms of lessons and observations that we have gained over the years of using coal technologies. Pulverized coal technologies are mature. Integrated gasification combined cycle technologies, there's only nine of them operating on coal in the world and only four in the United States. We've also learned that performance degrades with scale up. What we learn in the laboratory doesn't always hold true when we go into the full scale system many gremlins occur. Also, as we've observed with delays in implementing projects, financing, technology costs, and meeting schedules are important in determining the deployability of a technology. The next topic deals with first-of-a-kind and nth-of-a-kind technologies. Over the years, we have developed what I will call learning curve theory. What we find is the most expensive plant occurs on the first edition, by the time we get to the nth edition, the, the technology is mature and costs are reduced. 
learning curve technology for coal uses a factor that they call 0.06, which means that by the time you get to mature technology, you reduce the cost by 25%. In the case of the Kemper plant, a $4 billion program, 25% reduction is $1 billion. Also in the case of Kemper, we're talking about $8,000 a kilowatt for the cost of the plant versus $1,000 a kilowatt for a natural gas combined cycle plant. Coal is different from gas. Coal comes in three typical forms, bituminous, subbituminous, and lignite. Natural gas, you can buy it anywhere. It's the same thing. Also, when you look at the deployment of technologies, what I learn on my technology is different from what you learn on your technologies. I don't share my results. As a result, while we might say we have different examples of technologies, they're all almost first of a kind because we don't share the technology, they have different systems, they apply to different coal. Technology integration is also important. We have to integrate a plant that has a new component with a pipeline, with a reservoir, and in many cases with a grid because we have to integrate the up and down performance of coal plants that might be changed from base load to a, a intermittent or peaking kind of a situation. In terms of the demonstrations that we have talked about that relate to this, this hearing, there are nine demonstrations that are referenced. Three relate to chemicals production, two are IGCC plants. One of them is based on the Kemper plant and trick technology, which has not been demonstrated. And the other one is a first of a kind as well. Saline aquifers are the kind of aquifers that I think we're looking at with future gen kind of deployments. And there's only one uh, example of that, and that future gen plant is not going to be on board until 2017. We've heard that capture technology is very expensive for uh, coal plants. Capture technology, for the most part, is based on amines. We know that works. But these technologies were developed for chemical plants, where the products that you sell can justify the extra cost that it would be to use those technologies. It is very expensive for a standalone coal plant. Also, we have issues concerned with legal and societal issues that also affect the cost of a plant and must be addressed. Cost and feasibility are not necessarily demonstrated. We can't find guarantees for the uh, projects that we would want to put in place. And I'm concerned that with the legislation, the way it's proposed, it will stifle development and planning for new plants. And without a driver, there will be no technology developed. Our friends in China are very interested in developing coal-based technologies. They have strong government support, and they are ahead of us in chemicals production, in power generation, and in their next five-year plan, they will be ahead of us in CCS deployments. We require strong federal support to maintain coal's presence in the marketplace, and I believe Congress and the federal government, the executive branch, should be more supportive of coal in maintaining it as part of our mix. In summary, I don't think the technologies that we're discussing are ready for deployment in the sense of being fundable by financiers or getting uh, uh, guarantees. I believe that if we are not keeping coal in our future mix, we will run out of workforce. People like me are getting older. And I believe federal support will help us to achieve the kind of goals that we want in introducing new technologies. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bajuro. Our third witness is uh, Mr. Kurt Walzer, Managing Director at the Clean Air Task Force. In this role, he provides oversight and support of organizational management as well as ongoing development and implementation of organizational strategy. Mr. Walzer has led the development of incentive policies for carbon capture that have been included in federal legislative proposals and helped lead the NGO support for several carbon capture projects. Mr. Walzer. Chairman Stewart, Chairman Loomis, and Ranking Members uh, Swallow and Bonamici, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Kurt Walzer. I'm the Managing Director of the Clean Air Task Force, an environmental nonprofit dedicated to catalyzing the development and global deployment of low-carbon energy technologies. First, let me explain why we believe CCS is needed. The world's power sector annual emissions are expected to double from 12 to 24 gigatons by mid-century. 
By 2015, China will have added 900 gigawatts of coal plants on top of our roughly 300 gigawatts of coal plants in the U.S. India and other developing countries are following suit. Without significant CCS deployment, we simply will not be able to achieve the deep reductions in CO2 emissions that are necessary to reduce the risk of catastrophic climate change. Returning to the question in front of the committee, CCS is technically feasible in the context of this rule because the rule requires partial, not full CCS, and because the rule allows a plant up to eight years to meet this standard. The 40% capture level is well within the experience of the technology. Moreover, if a plant intends to capture CO2 on the day it opens and can't because of unforeseen issues with, for example, completion of a CO2 pipeline, the eight-year compliance flexibility provision allows the plant to meet the standard over a longer time frame. The partial capture and sequestration requirement and flexibility provisions along with the ability to store CO2 in conjunction with enhanced oil recovery, or EOR, helps ensure the rule can be met at reasonable cost, even before any federal subsidies are considered. CATF undertook an analysis of the initial NSPS rule first proposed on April of 2012. As we can see by figure one on page eight of my testimony, the cost of electricity at a new coal plant that meets the partial CCS standard with EOR and takes advantage of the regulatory flexibility provision is only 13% higher than that of a new coal plant without CCS. CCS has been adequately demonstrated over its 40-year history in the U.S. Since the 1970s and 80s, large industrial plants have captured and stored large amounts of CO2 on a per-plant basis, up to 7 million tons per year. This experience is migrating to power plants. Nearly all new coal plants plan to have some level of CCS installed when they open. These include projects like the 582 megawatt Kemper plant in Mississippi, the Texas Clean Energy Project, and the Sask Power Coal's retrofit, Sask Power's Coal Retrofit Project in Canada, known as Boundary Dam. Each of the components of CCS have had a long history of use in the U.S. and around the world. Over 850 megatons of CO2 have been stored underground in Texas for EOR operations over the last 30 years. There are currently 4,000 miles of CO2 pipeline connecting CO2 with enhanced oil recovery projects. Pre-combustion capture technology has been commercially available since the 1950s and 60s with over 200 plant applications across the world. And post-combustion capture has been successfully applied to natural gas and coal plants with commercial guarantees offered from several vendors. Does CETF also support incentives for CCS? Absolutely. Many technologies such as SO2 scrubbers that have been deployed based on emission limits have continued to receive subsidies in order to make the technology more efficient and less costly. The EPA has long recognized that such subsidies are appropriately considered in evaluating the real cost of the standard. CATF is a member of the National EOR Initiative, an unusual coalition of advocacy groups, industry, and labor organizations that are coming together in support of self-financing production tax credits for CO2 EOR sourced by power plants and industrial sources. I should note that in addition to EOR's value in reducing costs, it also provides significant potential scale. The National Energy Technology Laboratory estimates the technical potential to sequester CO2 through EOR in the U.S. is as high as 80 million barrels or four, or 4 million barrels a day and require 20 gigatons of CO2. That represents about half of the total U.S. power sector emissions for the next 30 years. We believe that EPA's rules on sound legal and technical footing it is not the end of coal. Instead, it is the beginning of CCS worldwide. I appreciate the opportunity to testify this morning and look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Mr. Walter. Our final witness then is Mr. Roger Martella, partner of Sidney's Austin's Environmental Practice Group. He rejoined Sidney Austin in LLP after serving as General Counsel of the United States Environmental Protection Agency, concluding 10 years of litigation and handling complex environmental and natural resource matters at the Department of Justice and EPA. Mr. Martella served as EPA's chief legal advisor supervising an office of 350 attorneys and staff in Washington and 10 regional offices. Mr. Martella, welcome. Thank you, Chairman Stewart, um, Chairman Lewis, Ranking Member Bonamici, and Ranking Member Solwell for the opportunity and honor to be before you today and with my distinguished um, witnesses, speakers as well. I'm going to try to very briefly discuss the intersection of how these technical issues 
connect with the, the legal framework and, and try not to um, give you an entire legal dissertation on this, but just hit the high points and be happy to answer any questions you have. Very briefly, the whole reason we're here arises out of a 2007 decision called Massachusetts versus EPA by the Supreme Court. And in that decision, the Supreme Court said that EPA had to consider greenhouse gases alongside the other air pollutants in the Clean Air Act. I was general counsel at the time when the decision came down and was tasked with working with the EPA lawyers, um, most of whom are still there, and other talented lawyers in the federal government on coming up with a full range of legal options on how to implement the mandate in the Supreme Court's decision. And one of the things we looked at very, very closely, which was in a 2008 document released by EPA at the time, is the new source performance standard program. If you look at you know, the limited tools EPA has under the existing Clean Air Act to address greenhouse gases for stationary sources, the new source performance standard program clearly stands out. It is the most flexible of the provisions. It has a history of driving environmental results. It considers cost-benefit considerations. And of course, as we've talked about today, I think as everyone's familiar with, Congress directed EPA to, to um, focus on standards that were adequately demonstrated. So for it, it's pretty obvious if you look at this 2008 document and work that's been done since, the, the highlight of the, the focus of attention on addressing greenhouse gases under the Clean Air Act has been on the new source performance standard program when it comes to stationary sources. And so my critique is not with that as a general proposition. My critique is how EPA specifically proposed to go about this in September based on kind of some of the technical concerns you're hearing today. And I'm just going to, again, focus on, on two, the two words that matter the most for today's discussion, the words adequately demonstrate it. There is a maxim in the law that when Congress uses specific words, it has to mean something, that you have to actually pay attention to the specific words that Congress provides in the statute. And, and I recognize that that's never necessarily a black and white thing, that everything is a continuum, and even something such as adequately demonstrated does not lock anyone into any one interpretation, but a continuum of interpretations, unless you otherwise say that we shall do something or have to do something. So the question here is where on the continuum does EPA's approach fall? And, and it's, my, it's my position, it's my opinion that given the technical expertise of, of the folks here and, and other people that I've, I've spoken to, that this does fall past the endpoints of, of what is considered adequately demonstrated. The notion of requiring a technology is adequately demonstrated that is not currently in operation by, by EPA's own record, where EPA has said there's not a single facility in commercial operation today. Um, about 18 months ago in April 2012, in the predecessor proposal, they said that this technology was not likely to be adequately demonstrated for another 10 years, that even if we look back on the last 30 months of EPA's experience in granting permits for uh, greenhouse gas emissions across the country, that it has actually rebuffed arguments by certain groups that CCS is currently adequately demonstrated. It came as a surprise to me, and I think it is past the continuum for them to say back in September that currently carbon capture and sequestration is within the realm of options they can consider in saying something's adequately demonstrated. Now, having said that, we, we, there's been some uh, conversation already today about what is the precedent of this and what's the effect and does this really af affect anyone? And I think the, the concern as a whole is, is from the precedential perspective for a few reasons. First of all, the result of this rule, is, if this rule is finalized as it exists, I think it's fair to say that no coal-fired power plant could be built in the United States unless they could really um, demonstrate carbon capture and sequestration of the magnitude EPA requires. And, and the experts to my side here, some of them at least seem to think that's not possible. So the precedent of that is basically that, that this rule would have the effect of preventing an entire source of energy from being used in new facilities in the future. And so I think one of the questions that comes up is, is that within the legal authority of the Clean Air Act, can the Environmental Protection Agency, did Congress intend for EPA to have that kind of authority to say we're going to basically phase out this type of energy going into the future? And while I recognize there's not an apples-to-apples -apples comparison in terms of how this rule could impact existing sources or even sources in other sectors, I think it also has to be understood that there's no doubt that everyone's going to be looking to this rule as the baseline for how EPA will approach existing sec sources and how they might approach other sectors. I don't think they're going to start with a clean drawing board, but they're going to be looking to their approaches here, even if it's not carbon capture or sequestration. So I think there's little debate that this will have precedent on how they're going to approach other, other issues, other types of facilities. So thank you for that, and I look forward to answering any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Martella. Uh, to all of the witnesses, thank you for your testimony. Uh, I would like to remind members that committee rules limit the questioning to five minutes, and the chair at this point will open up the round of questions. 
and the chair recognizes himself for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Martella and Mr. McConnell, I'd like to come back to some comments that uh, both of you have made. Um, I, Mr. Martella, you said something I think uh, a little more graciously than I would have in the sense of uh, the meaning of words. I think that uh, this all started a few years ago perhaps when we heard that famous phrase, it depends on what the meaning of the word is, is. Uh, redefining words away from their original and their obvious intent opens up just a Pandora's box of craziness. Uh, who knows where it will end and who knows what the outcome eventually is going to be, which is the main point of this hearing. This isn't about climate change. This hearing isn't about the government shutdown and the effects of that. It's not even about the costs of implementing this rule. This is about, uh, and by the way, I have enormous concerns with the costs of implementing this rule but we're not there yet. This is about one thing and one thing only, and that is the EPA's, is the EPA being honest in their claim that a certain procedure has been adequately demonstrated? And in that, it's not adequately modeled, it's not adequately hypothesized, it's not adequately wished for, is it adequately demonstrated? and demonstrated in the real world and demonstrated in a way that could be replicated somewhere else. And in fact, replicated in a lot of different places as it's gonna to have to be in order for it to be implemented like that. So with that, Mr. Secretary, I'd like to come, come to you for just a minute. Let me ask first, just in background, when did you leave your position at DOE? February this past year. February. And how long did you work for the current administration then? Two years. Okay. And, and I'm, sure that, uh, I'm sure that was a great experience for you, working for the administration. And, and being here today, I suppose, you and I had a chance to, uh, to you know, have a short conversation before the hearing. And I, and I recognize that you know, it may be somewhat uncomfortable for you in the, in the fact that you've taken a position that's contrary to the current administration. Oh, I don't, I don't find it uh, difficult at all. It's, it's, a, it's a truth that we're, we're pursuing here. And uh, the, the commercial viability and technical demonstration is all about what we were doing and continue to do with the pretty sizable federal funding of the R&D that's going on. Now, it seems to me to be a little difficult to balance the fact that if something's already technically demonstrated and commercially available, why we would continue to fund R&D in that regard. It's a, it's a bit of a conundrum and it's puzzling to me. Well, I appreciate that. that's a great point. To any of the witnesses, are, are any of you aware of any commercial scale power plant in the U.S. that's using CCS right now? Anywhere in the United States? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Plant Berry at, uh, for Southern companies is, is supplied CCS on their unit. It's a 25 megawatt uh, uh, project and they're capturing about 100 and 150 thousand tons per per year. Okay, and 25 megawatt is that a uh, is that a small or a large scale power plant? It's uh, a slip a, a slipstream project from the power plant. So it's a very small production of a of power that's generated from there, through relatively speaking. From that unit, yes. And and that's really one of the primary concerns we have, uh, and that is the the demonstrated scalability. You know, I was a pilot for for a long time. I was a type of pilot at one point where we flew test flights. And I'm telling you, you can't take something and say it works here on this scale and then increase that scale by many factors and just assume that it's gonna work exactly the same way. It won't, which is, again, one of our primary concerns here. Um, and uh, Dr. Bajuro, you mentioned that as well, the scaling up of technology. I'd be interested in your thoughts on that and your concerns about uh, you know, about trying to apply something that is as unique and complicated as this and just assume, and if I could, and then I'll allow you to answer this, quoting from an, the EPA's own findings from just several years ago, uh, typical power plant, there is considerable uncertainty, that's their word, considerable uncertainty associated with capacities at volumes necessary. Doctor, do you have comments on that? Yes, we often test technologies from test tube size in the laboratory to pilot plant size to commercial size. The comment you made earlier about the size of plants, we've put in place 12 plants uh, in the last seven, six years. Their average size is one gigawatt, that's 1,000 megawatts. Uh, 
we don't do that casually. We do it by building up. And the reason we do that is we learn things as we go from one size to another, the integration being the very important part. Okay, thank you. And again, that, I mean, I think the point there is, is just stated by, uh, in one fashion or another, by the EPA themselves, that there's enormous concerns with the scalability on this. And with that, my time has expired. We now turn to the ranking member, Ms. Bonamici. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Walter, I wanted to talk a little bit with you about uh, the, the different standards that we've been hearing about today. We've heard commercially available, technically ready, uh, but the EPA really does look at whether the technology is adequately demonstrated, which of course is different in legal terms. Would, do you agree with that? Absolutely. Uh, the, the Clean Air Act very clearly allows uh, EPA to consider how the technology applies in other related industries. And I think in some area there's, there's a bit of a gray area for uh, some relating to your earlier question, Mr. Chairman. So for example, Dakota Gasification is an excellent example of a project which is at very large scale, uh, captures uh, two, million, 2 million tons of CO2 per year and uh, sends it uh, up a pipeline to Saskatchewan for EOR and sequestration. The methane that comes out of that coal gasification project is delivered in the pipeline to power plants. It's very similar to a power plant that was proposed by Tenasca, uh, which would have simply taken that same uh, industrial configuration and put the power plant closer to, to that uh, uh, methane, uh, the coal to methane project. So uh, from a practical perspective, it's not the, the, the Dakota gasification plant I believe clearly demonstrates that one could develop a power plant today with commercial guarantees with CCS. Uh, in fact, that even though that's hap even though Kemper does have commercial guarantees, I think the Dakota gasification plant clear clearly demonstrates that CCS at a power plant uh, uh, configuration is in operation today. Thank you, and I'm, I'm going to follow up on that a bit. If finalized, the rule would require that all new coal plants meet an emission rate between 1,050 and 1,100 pounds of CO2 per megawatt hour. So that's an approximate 40 percent reduction below uncontrolled emission levels, as I understand it. That's right. But in addition, the rule allows for up to eight years to meet the standard. Can you discuss how that provision uh, re was uh, considered in EPA's determination of feasibility and, and cost? Uh, sure. That provision is, from our perspective, one of the key uh, aspects that makes this rule, uh, 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 the design of this rule, very smart and uh, speaks to the technical feasibility of uh, uh, being able to comply with the rule. Uh, with that eight-year provision that allows uh, a project developer to do two things. First, it allows them to have flexibility as their building uh, their first, second, third, or nth of a kind project. It also allows the developer market flexibility to be able to take advantage of uh, operating the plant in the early years without CCS and adding CCS later, which might provide financial uh, value. Uh, in fact, it's that second component which allows, as our uh, cost analysis shows, for uh, the uh, a project to be able to comply with that standard and have the cost of electricity at that coal unit be 13 percent above uh, the baseline cost of electricity for an uncontrolled coal unit. Thank you. I have an, another question I want to get in. So uh, there was a, a project that uh, American Electric Power was doing. Uh, their chairman in 2011, Michael Morris, said that as a regulated utility, it's impossible to gain regulatory approval to recover our share of the cost for validating and deploying the technology without federal requirements to reduce greenhouse gas emissions already in place. The uncertainty also makes it difficult to attract partners to help fund the industry share. So I want to, to you to address briefly the um, – unless we require carbon emission limits on new coal power plants, do, does the technology stand uh, as much of a chance of wider deployment, and why? Well, I, I do agree with that, and, but let me address one important aspect of uh, what you just raised. I would urge the, cons the committee to consider um, that, in fact, uh, this rule is good for the coal industry. And let me, let me explain um, that counterintuitive view. 
Uh, first, the rule provides both certainty and flexibility for new coal plants uh, regarding CO2 emissions. Um, if, you, uh, if you don't have that certainty, you're not going to be able to finance new coal plants. No financing, no plants. It's, it's basically that simple. Second, the rule does something that might have been hard to imagine 30 years ago for the first time. New coal plants and new gas plants are going to have the same emissions profile. That's important for, for coal's long-term uh, sustainability. And third, gas prices are so low that no one is building new coal, and that's true without CCS, but this rule helps catalyze technology advancement so that when fuel prices are uh, more advantageous, coal is even better positioned within the market. Thank you, and I see my time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Ms. Manamichi, and uh, Mr. Walter, you yourself as almost uh, – almost by yourself required that we come back to a second round of questioning because I can't wait to engage you with your comments there about this is good for the coal industry. Uh, with that, then, we turn to the uh, chairwoman of the uh, subcommittee on energy, Ms. Lummis. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Secretary McConnell, does it make any sense to you that EPA is concluding that CCS is adequately demonstrated or proven when the DOE modeling assumes carbon capture technology is unproven at commercial scales. Uh, no, it doesn't make any sense to me. And uh, in fact, in 2010, a roadmap was put forth that uh, with demonstration projects and the development of the fossil program would produce a commercially ready, technically deployable CCS value proposition for the marketplace by 2020. And the expectations were that the demonstration projects, the knowledge, the understanding, and the learnings that would be accomplished through all of that would produce something that would be marketplace ready by 2020. And declaring it ready now, I don't see as, uh, as something that makes any sense to me, no. Mr. Walter, you mentioned uh, this eight-year period. Is, is, is that what Mr. McConnell is referencing? That is, is there, do I, should I be drawing a connection between the eight years that you mentioned and Mr. McConnell's statement about the year 2020 applicability? Uh, Madam Chairman, I, I, from our perspective, just a uh, quick reference, the original proposal actually had a 10-year uh, uh, delay that was uh, in the revision it was made eight years because that comports with the eight-year review period that relates to new source performance standards so I think that's really what what the eight year what is driving the eight-year uh, review or uh, uh, flexibility provision within this rule uh, okay so they're very different I'm trying to compare apples yeah, to oranges yeah. here okay right. that's helpful um, so if the technology is ready today why the eight years again from our perspective, uh, we think it's valuable because we want to see projects built. And we think that kind of flexibility encourages projects. Uh, it, it reduces their cost. It provides them flexibility as they are uh, developing pioneer projects. We want, uh, you know, did, we, we like to say we, we want to avoid pioneer penalties. We want early, early adopter rewards. And this, I think, is in vain with that uh, concept. Okay, so it is a pioneer situation. Uh, for a any project that, well, uh, there are multiple pioneer situations. For example, um, but how does the word y your use of the word pioneer um, comport with the EPA's def definition of adequately demonstrated? Well, adequately demonstrated, as I mentioned before, can be related to um, uh, or can, can refer to related industries. Uh, so. You know, for example, I would consider um, uh, even though we have a uh, fully commercial scale gasification project at Dakota Gasification that is taking CCS, you know, CO2 and sending up to Alberta, or excuse me, Saskatchewan, uh, Lucadia proposed a substitute natural gas program in Indiana, which is very similar. Uh, and we were supportive of that project because even though it wasn't a power project, it would have created a pipeline, the first CO2 pipeline from the Midwest to the Gulf Coast. Um, I would consider them a pioneer even though that technology is commercial. 
I think you said CCS is being used today on natural gas units? CCS, well, CCS has been used on natural gas units for power plants. Okay, so why not require this rule be applied to gas? Why is it just applied to coal? We are actively supporting CCS on natural gas projects. So, for example, there's Summit Power has a... Okay, so why did the EPA just require it for coal? Well, from our perspective, I'll speak from our perspective, we see, we don't see this rule as the last step. We see it as the first step. Ah, okay, thanks. That's helpful. For the eight-year review... Dr. Pachura, excuse me, because I'm going to use, I have one more question. Dr. Pachura, the Interagency Task Force on CCS identified five barriers to commercial deployment of CCS. What has changed in the two years since their conclusion? We have done some experiments to demonstrate storage at larger scale, but we haven't done any integration to show how we could put that together with a power plant, nor have we addressed the issue of long-term liability. Who owns the CO2 for 50 years? Who's going to take the responsibility for certifying that the technology was correct when it was put in the ground? I want to thank all of our panelists. I hate to interrupt, but my time has expired. Thank you all for being here. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. The Chair now recognizes Mr. Swalwell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And actually, if we could put slide number one back up there. And Mr. Walzer, good morning. Thank you to you and all of our witnesses for being here. Slide one, I held it up earlier, and it will be on the screen in a moment, depicts about 600 coal plants across the country. Are you familiar with this map and these plants? Would you agree, Mr. Walzer, that the proposed regulations that the EPA have put out will not affect a single plant that is on that map? Absolutely. Even before this rule was contemplated and even before gas prices went through the floor, there was no new coal plant that was proposed without CCS. Any new coal plant today that has been seriously proposed will meet the new coal plant standard. For existing units, this rule doesn't apply, so it's not going to have any effect on them. And, Mr. Walzer, how many jobs at existing coal plants will be lost because of these regulations for future plants? There will be no – I think it's simple logic that if the rule does not apply to existing units, it will not affect jobs at existing units, so no jobs. And, Mr. McConnell, would you agree that these regulations will not affect a single job at a currently existing plant? No, I wouldn't. Okay. Would you agree – so it's your position that if I have a job today at a coal plant that's already in existence, I'm at risk of losing my job at that plant because of rules for plants that have not been built? I think if we focus the argument strictly on one particular pollutant criteria, we could build an argument around it, but it's much more complex than that. It's the future uncertainty of rulings. It's the combination of NOx, SOx, suspend particulate, mercury, all of the criteria pollutants, and the landscape associated with that uncertainty going forward. You see a tremendous amount of retirements going on across the country today, some 50 gigawatts of retirement. But, Mr. McConnell, the 600 plants that are in existence, you agree these rules do not directly affect those plants? No, I don't. Again, as I go back to the interconnection of all the rulings and the future uncertainty of it, that has a multiplying effect to the future of all of those coal plants. But you can't give me an accurate number as to how many jobs are going to be lost at a current plant because of regulations for future plants, can you? I'm not able to provide that kind of information, no, sir. Again, it's all part of the future that you or I can't predict. And you would agree, though, that 120,000 jobs lost in 16 days during a government shutdown, that's probably greater than the amount of jobs we can say will be lost at existing plants? 
I'm not in a position to comment on that. Uh, I would hope, though, Mr. McConnell, that you could comment on something I think you and I may agree upon, which is that uh, sequestration uh, has affected our ability to make necessary investments in technology when it comes to uh, carbon capture use and storage technologies. Would you agree that that is not helping us uh, learn more about what that technology could do? What I could agree on was that when I took the job in 2010 and we projected for the next 10 years that we would stay at a certain level of funding for fossil energy to move forward and to achieve a commercially demonstrated technology by 2020, and then seen the fossil budget cut year over year with the administrative requests going down while the overall Department of Energy goes up, that made it very difficult to achieve those, uh, those targets and makes it all the more difficult to understand how we can get demonstrated technology in place any earlier than 2020, certainly. Thank you, Mr. McConnell. And Mr. Walzer, uh, can you just go into detail for us about the current competition between the coal and natural gas uh, industries and whether that uh, competition is at least a partial reason, if not the primary reason, for the retirement and lack of construction of new coal plants across the country. And then could you just let us know what would the cost of doing nothing be? Suppose we threw out these regulations and just did nothing. What would the cost to the environment uh, and economy be? So. Um Develop, here's, here's what I would say. Uh, project developers today are building natural gas plants instead of coal plants primarily because of where gas prices are. Um, that's, what the, that's what's happening in the market. Um, in terms of existing units, uh, gas prices had gotten so low that we, for the first time ever, had seen coal boilers switch over to natural gas, which many of us thought would never happen. But that's starting to come back. And uh, so as gas prices are going up, uh, we're starting to see coal generate, we're existing unit coal generation come back on the system. Um, but uh, because of where gas prices are, we don't foresee, or at least looking at the market, the market tells us there are no uh, plans for developing new coal projects because of where gas prices are today. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back, uh, balance my time. Thank you, Mr. Fall. You know, regarding your question about uh, existing power plants and will they be affected, I think, Mr. Walter, you answered that question in a previous round, and that is when you said you view this as just the beginning. And I think that's many of the fears that uh, so many of us have. Uh, with that, to the Vice Chairman, Mr. Bidenstein. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I can tell you there are two coal-fired power plants uh, in Oklahoma that are being shuttered uh, because of EPA regulations. And I can also tell you that my constituents are facing 25 percent increases um, in their prices because of it. Um, and these, these coal-fired power plants have like 30 years left in their useful lives, um, and we're shuttering them because of these, uh, because of these regulations. Um, I would like to talk uh, to Mr. Walter. Uh, you, you mentioned early adopter rewards. Can you talk about that for just one second? Sure. Uh, we would like to see um from our perspective, we want to see CCS move forward, and we would like to see uh, a suite of policies that help both deploy the technology and drop, the, drop its costs rapidly. Uh, is, is the Kemper project uh, one of those projects where you've seen early adopter rewards? Well, in some respects, uh, Kemper has received um, incentives, federal incentives to move forward. Uh, so, in, so in that context, uh, it's gotten... I'd like to read you an article from the Wall Street Journal. Um, and this is just a few weeks ago, Monday, October 14th, as a matter of fact. Mississippi powers 186,000 customers who live in one of the poorest regions of the country are reeling at double-digit rate increases. And even Mississippi Power's parent, Atlanta-based Southern Company, has said Kemper shouldn't be used as a nationwide model. Do you agree with that? I believe that the cost overruns associated with Kemper are not related to CCS. It's related to the fact that they're commercializing a new gasification technology. And so from that perspective, I believe Kemper could be a model uh, for integrating uh, CCS under power systems. 
It's interesting you should say that. They said that their cost overruns are from labor costs, steel pipe, concrete, other materials, um, and certainly if it wasn't for CCS, a lot of these materials wouldn't be required. Is that correct? And labor? I think most of the labor costs and piping that you're referring to really address is based on the fact that they're effectively developing a refinery technology, which is not what power companies are used to doing. So these, these, these costs, do you know how they're affecting not just, um, I mean, we're, we're talking about some of the poorest people in America being affected by this. Uh, they spend a good portion of their budgets more as a percentage of their income on their electric bills, and their electric bills are going up. Do, do you have uh, sympathy or empathy for them? I think that uh, it's important to make sure that any time we're moving technology forward that, we, that uh, we try to have the least amount of impact on the people who can least afford it. And I think that's true uh, in the U.S. and I think that's true globally. That's why we're supporting uh, not just these performance standards but incentives at the federal level that will help reduce the cost. So real quick, I want to talk about these incentives. So in Meridian, Mississippi, uh, I, I'm a Navy pilot. I flew in Meridian, Mississippi. I lived there for a period of time. I can tell you this is not a wealthy part of the country. Meridian, Mississippi, just south of Kemper County, uh, Newburn Atkinson, he's a gentleman. Uh, he says that his Lucas Road art and jewelry gallery hasn't recovered from the recession. I'm already on a shoestring budget in this economy, the 66-year-old says. And this may be the deciding factor in me staying open. Uh, so, so here we have, you know, we have people saying that power plants are not being shuttered. In fact, they are. We have people saying that this is actually uh, an early adopter rewards program, which it isn't. It's punishing people. It's punishing the poor people. It's also punishing the investors, which prevents investment in further technologies like this. And, and then you talk about incentives. Let's talk about incentives. Uh, we have a chart. Do we still have that chart, of the Department of Energy chart about incentives for R&D for different, uh, different areas? Do we have that chart? Well, if, while we're waiting for the chart to come up, uh, I'll, I'll share with you what's, uh, what's on this chart. On this chart, you have incentives for natural gas and liquid petroleum on the left. It's almost nothing. It's uh, 64 cents per megawatt hour. Nuclear is $3.14 per megawatt hour. Wind, $56 per megawatt hour. And then solar on the far right, if that bar on the far right, if the chart were big enough, it would go through the roof. Uh, for wind, it's $775 per megawatt hour or 64 cents for gas. Now, do you think it would be a good idea to maybe shift some of those incentives from wind and solar maybe over to the gas and and fossil fuel side? Uh, we, we think we should have more incentives on the fossil fuel side, absolutely. But you don't think it should be taken from, you know, it's you know, 1,400 times more on, 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 you know, solar energy. Do you think that that might be a good place to start? We're not, uh, here, here's what I can say what we, we, what we support. We support, uh, as I mentioned before, the National EUR Initiative which is focusing on a production tax credit for CO2 enhanced oil recovery from coal plants, gas plants, industrial sources. And what's really unique and interesting about that proposal is that because you are generating petroleum through EUR in the U.S., you're also displacing foreign oil production. That potentially could add new revenue to U.S. Treasury. And so that's a really unique and interesting opportunity, and we think we should pursue that. I'm out of time, Chairman. It's uh, your mic. Okay. Thank you. Uh, then we turn time now to uh, Mr. Takano. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, improving air quality and reducing greenhouse emissions is a matter that is vitally important to my constituents in Riverside County, which is located in Southern California. Uh, I represent um, an area that has some of the worst air quality in the nation. I remember days growing up uh, when we weren't allowed to play outside in the, on the playgrounds um, uh, during my elementary and high school days. Um, for physical education class because the air pollution was so bad. It's because the Clean Air Act and the work by the EPA uh, that my region has seen in, uh, tremendous improvements uh, in air quality. In fact, a study by the EPA shows that by 2020, the benefits of the Clean Air Act will outweigh the costs by more than 30 to 1. Uh, the Clean Air Act has helped improve public health and by 2020 is expected to prevent 17 million uh, lost work days. 
I appreciate the uh, hearing uh, from our witnesses today about EPA's latest effort to limit greenhouse gas emissions under the Clean Air Act. My first question is for uh, Mr. Walzer. Mr. Walzer, do we do you know of any other nations that are investing in CSS technology? Uh, yes, um, uh, several. Uh, the United Kingdom, for example, has a competition for what they call a contract for differences to build at least two large-scale CCS projects. Uh, but probably the most interesting and notable is China. They're investing uh, quite a bit in uh, CCS. Uh, in fact, uh, Huanang Power, what their largest power company, has uh, developed their own CCS technology that they are currently uh, doing a feasibility study with Duke Energy on uh, one, of the, one of the Gibson units in uh, Indiana to examine how those costs uh, of CCS in China, which they claim are fairly low, about $30 a ton, would, would uh, equate in the U.S. And, and um, can you tell me about the overall budget for R&D for the, all these all of the above technologies? I mean, I, I understood that chart presented by my colleague from Mississippi, but the, uh, the distribution um, of uh, in, uh, an R&D investment, but uh, what has been um, the size of that budget over the last three or four years, and has it been increasing or decreasing? Well, the, the overall size of the DOE budget has been increasing, but I would echo what uh, Since Secretary McConnell said uh, with respect to uh, CCS. We believe that the, the uh, DOE's budget on CCS should be increased. Um, uh, now, this... Uh, you used the word pioneering uh, in your uh, answer to uh, my colleague from Wyoming. Um, would you say that the strategy of the department um, or the EPA is really about maybe birthing uh, this technology that we have, when we say we have an uh, adequately demonstrated technology, uh, that really the rule is designed to, uh, to birth it? That has been uh, a role that the Clean Air Act has played through several pollution control technologies, and we feel that this is a role that can play here. Um, just to clarify some earlier remarks I made, um, uh, we do see this as the first step. Uh, we do think CCS ought to be applied on natural gas units, and uh, another opportunity to do that will be in the eight-year review, uh, as well as looking at best available control technology. Uh, through uh, individual permits after new source, uh, after the new source standards are uh, are finalized, uh, so we do see this as uh, the beginning of a process. Um, we don't necessarily anticipate that this is going to apply to existing units through any uh, rules that are going to be put forward, uh, but we do hope and expect, and we would advocate for in the future that this would, uh, technology would be, be applied to natural no, gas. Now, real quickly, the the, the Kemper plant is a coal gasification uh, plant, but the existing coal plants, uh, which will not be affected by this rule, are not attempting to gasify. They're, they just strictly use the coal uh, directly into the production of, inter of electricity. Is that correct? Right. Most existing units are coal combustion units. So you, when you talked about the increased cost at Kemper, uh, it has to do with this newer attempt, this attempt to try to gasify the coal. Um, uh, but if coal plants in the future were to be straight combustion plants, uh, you're contending that the CSS technology has been demonstrated in other areas and, and could work in, this, in, in the context of newer coal combustion plants? Uh, well, actually, the, the, yes. In fact, the Boundary Dam um, uh, plant is an interesting example because, in fact, it's a retrofit, but it is using uh, the same technology that one would use if one were building a new coal combustion plant. Um, similarly, NRG in, uh, in the U.S. is uh, currently um, developing a, C a, a retrofit, a CCS retrofit project that could also apply to new coal combustion units. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My time is up. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. Uh, now, Mr. Weber from Texas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think we're going to affect coal plants because as coal tech, as that technology gets so expensive, more plants won't be built, and the older plants will retire and employees will lose their jobs, so that's a given. And look, um, I think it was Mr. Mortella said that when Congress uses words, it means something. I think it was you that said that. Is that right, Mr. Mortella? 
That's Thank you. I appreciate that. It's kind of like if you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. If you like your insurance, you can keep your insurance. Uh, that's kind of what you're driving at, I expect. And I guess that oil sequestration is an okay word or carbon sequestration is okay, but when you talk about budget sequestration, that's a bad word. So it's interesting that we see a lot of word games going up here, going on up here. Um, let me ask you, are any of you aware, familiar with the Valero plant in Port Arthur, Texas, in my district, that has a carbon sequestration facility? Do you, do, does, uh, Mr. McConnell, are you aware of that plant? Do you know the cost that was involved? Any of y'all know the cost of that plant? Let me, let me give it to you real quickly. The Valero project costs $431 million, okay? The Department of Energy, through the stimulus, or what I call the spend from us, kicked in $284 million. Now, that's 66% of the cost of that plant. Does that sound as capable of being duplicated to, to anybody? Does the government have to spend 66% of these facilities and these plants? Does the taxpayer get to be on the hook? Does that sound like it's capable of being duplicated? That's a rhetorical question I'll give back to you. <laughs> Ed Holland, the CEO of um, Southern Energy, on the plant built in Kemper, uh, Mississippi, came and spoke to the House Energy Action Team, of which I'm a member of, about a month ago. And here's what he, and let me tell you something about Southern Energy and the Kemper, the plant they're building. Four billion dollars. It creates 12,000 direct and indirect jobs for construction, 1,000 direct and indirect permanent jobs. The project construction will create $75 million in state and local taxes. $30 million annually in state and local taxes. So this is a project that's extremely important and valuable to the community, and yet because of CCS, of which Texas is a pioneer, uh, one of you, I think it was you, Mr. Walter, or might have been Mr. Martell, said there was already EOR underway. In other words, what you really said without knowing it was industry was already on this. Industry was already on this without the mandate from the EPA because they'll they'll get it to work efficiently they will make it work efficiently now when ed holland from southern energy came and spoke to the house energy action team he said ccs is not capable of being duplicated the cost overruns were enormous and he attributed it to ccs now to their credit the company agreed to pick up all the cost overruns and you don't see that very often when the government mandates something that's a rarity but the cost overruns were attributed to CCS. He told us that in the House Energy Action Team. Now, with what you know about Valero's cost, 66% picked up by the DOE, the taxpayers, and the cost overruns, can, is there anyone on this panel that thinks that's really capable of being duplicated, Mr. McConnell, yes or no? Well, I believe that's the reality of where we are today because it's not technically demonstrated and commercially available. Thank you. Dr. Bajura? I support Secretary McConnell's comment. You, what he said. <laughs> Mr. Walter, what they said. Could you, could, could you clarify your Do point? you think those two experiences demonstrate that CCS of that magnitude on the scale that the EPA is mandating here is capable of being duplicated? I think we've seen CCS on the scale of 7 million tons per year at projects like Lavar. Does, does the cost or the cost overruns not even come into the EPA's? That's a purely commercial project. That's a purely commercial project. So when it comes, EPA is real big about attainment. We don't want noxious gases, and we want the country to be in most of the country to be in attainment. But they don't use the common sense of determining from a cost basis whether it's going to negatively impact industry and jobs. So would you agree with me then, Mr. Walsh, that in that instance, the EPA might themselves, when it comes to common sense, be in non-attainment? <laughs> Mr. Martella, how do, you, do you think that it's duplicable? I have to put my lawyer's hat back on, and as a lawyer, you can only look at the record of what EPA itself relies upon in making these determinations. And I go back to my original opinion, looking simply at things that they said in this record in the past 18 months or so. Um, I think it's their own admissions that show none of these facilities are in commercial operation. To the Was that admission or emission? <laughs> Ad admission. Okay. Well, they're Ad putting out some emissions, all right, EPA is. But I appreciate that opinion, I, and I'm overrun on my time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we now have Ms. Edwards. 
Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and to our uh, ranking members as well for holding this hearing, and thanks to our witnesses. Um, I, I just have a couple of questions I want to try to get to, but I want to point out that contrary to some suggestions that have been made here today, uh, the President's energy strategy, in fact, has embraced the all of, above, all of the above approach. He said that on many occasions, even when some of us didn't want him to say all of above. Um, indeed, the rulemaking envisions, I think, a 21st century approach to uh, fossil fuel powered plants uh, with the goal of reducing CO2 emissions in new powered plant, power plants. And I think it's important to point out uh, the word new. Uh, in the uh, Recovery Act, the President committed $1.4 billion um, to uh, this technology, um, even in the face of some of us who question, frankly, the, the technology. But that uh, being as it might, the EPA has come up with a rule. It has a specific responsibility, a particular responsibility, to protect our health and environment. Um, and while um, industry, industry considerations are interesting, uh, that is not the principal responsibility of the, um, of the EPA. But I think that we can, I happen to think that we can do both, that we can both protect the environment and we can grow jobs and we can grow an energy uh, strategy that really embraces um, all of those responsibilities. Um, my question, first question goes to Mr. McConnell. Uh, something you said kind of caught my attention. Um, about the, the jobs questions. Were you referring to a specific empirical uh, study, university study, industry study that points to the number of jobs that would be lost by applying standards to new powered plants versus old? I can't quote any specific study here, only that I've been exposed to a number of um, studies from well, several different If you could sources. get back to us on that and give us the particular studies, because I'm a data person and I'd like to see the data that backs up your conclusions that jobs would be lost by applying a rule to new powered plants, power plants versus um, old ones. And I'd like to see those numbers. And then um, my uh, next question goes to Mr. Wartzler. I noticed that um, you know, in the, the industry, the oil and gas industry receives subsidies to the tune of about $7.5 billion a year. Um, ExxonMobil made $7.5 billion in profits in 2012, Occidental $7.1 billion. The numbers are really huge. Um, it seems to me that if we have an interest in doing with what Mr. McConnell points out in his testimony is the need to add $100 million uh, a year into uh, demonstrating these projects in, in research and development that, um, you know, $100 million could come out of that $7.5 billion in subsidies that the industry uh, receives. And so um, I wonder, Mr. Wurzler, if you could tell us um, what the additional needs you see in terms of investment in R&D and, and whether we've made the kind of investments we need to go to this, um, to go into the commercial um, side with, uh, with these coal plants and the new regulations because if, for example, we needed to find more money, perhaps my colleagues on the other side uh, in this very constrained environment would be willing to remove those oil and gas subsidies so that we could put the money into demonstrating new technologies. Thank you. Let me uh, first go back to what we think is the most important objective. We think that CCS needs it to be deployed globally and it needs to be affordable. So we need to move the technology forward as quickly as possible. So that brings us back to, uh, with respect to the oil industry, enhanced oil recovery is an opportunity in the U.S. We could uh, potentially uh, have 100 gigawatts of coal plants, about a third of our coal plants, supplying CO2 for EOR that would produce domestically produced oil uh, if we met the technical um, potential for EOR in this country. Uh, we believe that uh, a self-financing tax incentive is uh, a very um, smart and effective way to move that technology forward. It, what's interesting about that number, 100 gigawatts, is if you look with the history of scrubbers and other technologies, that you can, you can significantly push the cost down the cost curve at that scale. It's also going to bring new technologies into the market, so in terms of research and development. 
two interesting technologies, just some examples. One is called chemical looping, which would dramatically increase the efficiency in coal plants and dramatically reduce the cost of CCS. Another are, uh, would be advanced uh, natural gas turbines. Uh, there's uh, at least one company that has a design that would uh, uh, significantly drop the cost of uh, CCS to the point they think they can compete in the market today. So it's, it's that sort of mix of performance standards and incentives that could pull those new technologies into the market while getting the, the learning curve uh, moving forward. And that's our vision for how we think we move this technology in the U.S. and how we think it, and, and the value that that's going to have globally. Thank you, and uh, my, uh, my time has expired, and so I would really love to see us um, move to a point where we're making investments through our tax code that are about new technologies and not just supporting an old industry that's making record profits. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Edwards. We now turn to the uh, former full chairman, Mr. Hall. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I really do thank you for calling this, uh, having this hearing and working together. And if I understood your purpose, uh, it's a little bit different to the five-minute dissertation that Mr. Walser just gave us. It's not about gigalots or, or anything else that he wants to decide, but I think yours is about honesty and whether or not the EPA has been honest with this committee and honest with the people. I, uh, and that's, that's the first thing I say. I also admire Mr. McConnell, who chose truth as his purpose and his pursuit, and he's here with us today. Uh, and I want to point out that we did have hearings uh, by the, from the EPA during the time of my chairmanship. I think, Mr. Rohrbacher, we had them two or three times before us, and each time and they were talk, they testified for days and went all over the country looking for someone that would testify that fracking was rent running the drinking water. And if you're looking for honesty, you can check them on that because either Mr. Rohrbacher or I asked the four who were administrative witnesses that came here, each of them testifying to the dangers of that and the liberal press talking about the dangers of it. We asked this question of, in closing, can you tell us anywhere in the United States where fracking has ruined one glass of drinking water. Each of the administration witnesses said no. All four of them. That's of record. You don't have to have somebody come in here and testify to that again. It's of record. They themselves said that. So they're not being honest with us. And, and I think if we get a president that will appoint a secretary of some of his administrations uh, that will follow the law, why? We'll have a take a good look at some of their testimony when they've come here before us and testified under oath, and they were reminded that they were under oath that uh, they were operating from the best signs. Uh, let me get to something, though, a little more. This hearing sheds light on the technological basis for the EPA's conclusion that CCS has been, quote, adequately demonstrated, unquote, and its proposal that CCS should be required for new coal-burning plants. Once again, the testimony has shown that the EPA's proposed mandate reflects flawed judgment again. Uh, I might uh, ask you, Mr. McConnell, if you'd like to expand on that. Well, just to be brief, when something's mandated and determined to be technically demonstrated, commercially available, and it isn't, that makes it impossible for industry to make an investment. And by virtue of that, it will eliminate the ability to build new coal generation in this country. And maybe more importantly, as we think about a global world that the energy is going to double over the next 50 years, to get that technology to other places in the world is, uh, is incredibly important because this is a global issue, not just a U.S. issue. And I thank uh, Chairman Lubmus, uh, who wished the EPA could be here and be here and testify again for you all to hear. I don't know how much time do I have left, Le Mr. Chairman, or if I run out You've of got time. about a minute and a half. All right, sir. Uh, Mr. McConnell, we in, in Texas are very proud to be leaders. Uh, Mr. Weber got onto that, uh, and I certainly agree with his approach. I like the way he identified some of the President's promises. Uh, but in 
the Texas Clean Energy Project is a, quote, now-gen, unquote. That's an integrated uh, classification combined cycle facility that will incorporate CCS as a commercially clean coal power plant. And it's my understanding, and I may be wrong, but that this project received a $450 million award in the 2010 uh, f from the Department of Energy's Clean Coal Power Initiative and received the final air quality permit from the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality in 2010. My question, I guess, once again, is to you, Mr. McConnell. Has this project begun? No, sir. There's been no ground broken and no construction. What are some of the challenges associated with it? The commercial viability, as well as the concerns about the demonstrated technology, have made it incredibly challenging to uh, enable commercial realization. And that has delayed the start of that plant and construction for a considerable amount of time. And my last question, what about the status of other power plants, CCS projects around the country? How far along the construction are they? Outside of the Kemper plant that's been mentioned several times, none of them are operational or in construction. And every one of them require government subsidies at this point because of the technology readiness and commercial availability. Once again, I thank you, and Mr. Chairman, I thank you very much for having this hearing based on seeking honesty from people who come before us to testify. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We now turn to uh, Mr. Massey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a, uh, just a quick question for all of the witnesses. For a given uh, kilowatt hour or gigawatt, uh, gigawatt hour production plant, um, if we had a, a typical state-of-the-art coal-fired plant and we had this, the same plant but hypothetically with CCS technology, and I say hypothetically because it doesn't exist yet, but two plants producing the same amount of energy, one has CCS, one does not. It, for each of the witnesses, which one burns more coal, Mr. McConnell? To produce the same amount of electricity, the one with the CCS facilities, obviously, because of the parasitic load. Dr. Pajer? I concur with the Secretary. The one with CCS burns more coal. Mr. Waltz? Yes, I agree. What, what, what do you agree with? The one with CCS burns more coal. And Mr. Martell? I agree. So uh, we're all in agreement that the CCS technology makes a coal plant less efficient. Uh, do all the witnesses agree with that? Yes. Okay. So um, I think that's important to start out there. Now, the coal companies, and let me tell you why I'm motivated to ask these questions. I'm from Kentucky. We're uh, very proud of our electric generation in Kentucky. I don't have any coal mines in my district, yet we have two electric arc furnaces. One produces stainless steel, one produces steel. Um, Kentucky's a big producer of aluminum. And so this is not about coal for me, per se. This is about affordable domestic energy. And um, this is a very serious step we, when we increase the cost of domestic energy. How, Mr. Walter, how much more costly per kilowatt hour would it be to produce electricity with CCS? Uh, our study that we submitted in testimony indicated that uh, to comply with this rule, uh, a new coal plant today would be about $100 per megawatt hour, and the uh, the on a percentage basis, what would it be? How much higher to produce? Well, and 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 that was without CCS, and then the one with CCS would be 113, so it's 13 percent higher. You're saying 13 percent? We had a witness uh, just about a month ago say it was from the DOE say it was about 50 percent higher, and it, uh, so is that because it burns more coal? Is that one of the reasons? Uh, so, um, uh, yes, and I can explain okay. the, the difference between those. That's all right. I just wanted to check. And how much more coal does it burn to do CCS? Well, you, uh, I, I would have to go back and to do the 40 percent level to, that's well, uh, the administration on, on the chief reduction, on, correct? On the scale, depending on which, you know, if it's 13 percent or 50 percent, which number you're looking at, the, the amount of coal you have to burn is uh, you know, proportional to the uh, percentage of en energy penalty that you're, that you're paying. So what's, what's the number to achieve the 40 percent reduction? 
I'd have to go back and do the math, but it's it's uh, it could be. I don't know. I don't want to speculate. I'd have to go back and do the math. So the coal-fired generation plants in my district have uh, done a tremendous job of decreasing sulfur emissions, NOx emissions, particulate, mercury. All of these things have gone down by probably a couple orders of magnitude in the last three decades. But it still remains a fact, does it not, that those emissions are proportional to the amount of coal burned? If I understand your question correctly, is there an energy penalty on those pollution controls? Absolutely. But what I'm saying is when you burn more coal, do you emit more sulfur for any given plant? I see. Uh, uh, it depends on the pollution control. Let me uh, ask that question, Mr. McConnell. For, for given pollution control on a plant, if you burn more coal, does it emit more sulfur? Yes, and it would require more handling and more treatment to uh, process that sulfur, yes. So all things being equal, the, the effect of, of implementing CCS technology is we're going to burn more coal, and with the same emissions controls on mercury, particulate, sulfur, NOx, we're going to be emitting more of those given the administration's goals? That's not necessarily correct. In order but to given the same technology, uh, for all of those things. It looks to me like it would be the same. Let me also ask you, I, I want to move on, I have 26 seconds. Would we have to mine more coal to produce the same amount of power? Yes. So uh, all of the externalities that the uh, administration associates with mining coal would be increased with CCS? Potentially. Mr. McConnell, would you like to comment on that? I might suggest there may not be any coal mined at all because, in fact, the plants will shut down and there won't be any need for coal. That's, that's my concern. In fact, we have a plant in uh, Kentucky that's shutting down. It's going to affect 139,000 consumers of electricity in my district. So uh, I think it's a very important point to make that CCS is not without costs to the environment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Massey. We now turn to the gentleman from North Dakota, Mr. Kramer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks, members of the panel, for being here. And uh, It's hard almost to know where to begin. I've heard so many things this morning, but I'm going to start with addressing from the North Dakota perspective this issue of whether or not new source performance standards for new plants affects jobs with existing plants, and let me assure you it does because it is a further reflection of an attitude that has been pervasive by this administration that tells anybody interested in fossil fuel development, we're going to punish you as much as we can. And so if you're considering building a new plant or retrofitting an old plant, the, the, uh, the odds are against you. And it's, it's not like it's been a hidden agenda. It's been a pretty far out there agenda. I appreciate as well, uh, I'm going to use this opportunity to put a few things into the record. Uh, that Mr. Walzer has referenced several times the Dakota Gas Sinfuels plant at Beulah, North Dakota. I had the opportunity as an energy regulator for 10 years not only to oversee electric rates, um, but coal mining and pipeline development, and I cited the CO2 pipeline, much of it, that goes to Saskatchewan, and we're very proud of that project. The company that owns it, Basin Electric Power Cooperative, which is one of the largest G&T cooperatives in the country, also owns a lot of electric generation, coal combustion generation, right near Beulah. And they engaged with their own money in a demonstration project, 50% funded by Basin Electric's members and 50% funded by the state of North Dakota through a tax on coal, and concluded after the feed study that it was, in fact, not demonstrated to be economical to do a carbon capture and sequestration project at this time. And this is in a community right on the edge of the Bakken where there's a lot of a commercial application for CO2 should it enhance oil recovery. Obviously, all the incentives are there, and yet even at that, they concluded by their study that it was, in fact, not feasible to do it. So I want to put into the record, um, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, with your permission and the permission of the committee, a, a number of uh, documents referencing this feed study by Basin Electric. Um, if that's if that's acceptable. I, um, and then I have, a, I have a question for the panel because I think we, there is some premise um, for for this, when we talk about this adequately demonstrated standard and other standards, you know, previous previous Clean Air Act rules, whether it's 
Sox, Knox, Mercury, that, that have applied certain standards. Has there been a different or a, is there a benchmark or some histo historical lesson we could learn from previous rules and the availability of technology at that time versus what we're facing today? Is that, is that a fair characterization uh, for uh, a reasonable question, Mr. McConnell, and could, would you be able to answer? I think there's a, an interesting model to look at back into the 1970s when we were all concerned about Sox, Knox, Mercury, and suspended particulate. The government and industry formed a successful partnership together, not at odds with each other, but partnered with each other to develop technology to reduce those criteria pollutants by 90 percent over the next 40 years while we increase the amount of coal-generated power in this country by 200 percent. And that's through the miracle of technology. And in fact, I, I would hope that as we look to the future, we don't get simply bounded by what we know today in terms of performance and capabilities, but we're mindful of the fact that the investment for the future is really where we'll be and we'll need to be. And, and I certainly hope that rulings such as this don't promote a partnership between government and industry. Mm. They promote an adversarial circumstance and tends to block out an opportunity to advance coal, not promote it. Doctor, would you agree? I have concerns about the scale that we're talking about. I don't think the earlier technologies were as expensive as what we're discussing here. The earlier commentary about an energy penalty of 30 percent uh, costs a lot of money when you're talking about billion dollars per plant and ex excessive coal use. Uh, I agree with the Secretary. We need to find a way to move forward if we're going to solve this problem, and I think government support is essential. With just the remaining few seconds I have, uh, Mr. Walser, if you could just answer this. You would made reference that coal, making this coal cost more, and I, I'm going to paraphrase it. You're going to have to straighten it out for me. But you're saying that this actually benefits the coal-generated electricity by positioning it, positioning it well for when gas prices rise. Could you elaborate a little bit on that, how, how making it cost more positions it better should gas prices rise? So let me be clear. Uh, yeah, I don't please. know what gas prices are going to do. They may go up, they may go down. But uh, if we take this first step to begin the process of uh, deploying CCS technology and pushing it further down the cost curve, that will benefit coal in the future. I see. I'm out of time. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kramer. I would, if I could, Mr. Trump, I did, I, I don't think it's been ruled on my request to place into the record these documents from Basin Electric. Power. Without objection. Thank you. And. Is your good? Okay. I'm, I'm, yeah. Oh, I thought you meant you all did. I got you. Okay. We're going to get our act together up here, Dana. We just don't know when. But the, the gentleman from California is recognized for five minutes. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I have been running back and forth between hearings today. As usual, they schedule two of the most important hearings that I'm interested in at exactly the same time. So I'm sorry if I ask a, something that's repetitive that had been asked earlier. I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Martella. Um, you, you had uh, mentioned earlier in your opening statement that uh, there was a court decision in Massachusetts that the Supreme Court decided that the EPA is it has to consider or may consider CO2. Uh, you said it has to consider. Does it say that they have to uh, consider the CO2 or just may? The, the way I interpret the decision is they have to consider the they have to consider greenhouse gases, but they do not have to regulate them. The court made it clear it was not forcing EPA to regulate greenhouse gases, but it did have to consider. That is really an important distinction. Yes. And uh, certainly the court did not mandate that uh, they uh, uh, take steps to, uh, to take the CO2 uh, out of uh, energy production. Did they or did they say that has to be considered, but they didn't say they have to do it? Is that right? You're, you're absolutely right. And this is an important distinction. The court said the EPA can't ignore the consideration of greenhouse gases, but the court also explicitly said we're not telling EPA it must regulate greenhouse gases. It just said it has to look okay, at the so question. So this is not a mandate by the court. That's something we have to understand. Uh, what we're talking about is a, a uh, policy that has been determined that this is the direction that 
the executive branch wants to go because that's what they have determined is consistent with their policy goals, not necessarily with what the court is saying, not in contrast to the court, but not in direction and mandated by the court. Uh, carbon sequestration, uh, now I know you've had this question a number of times, so I am assuming that you all agree that the CCS costs a lot more than if you didn't have to do that. Is that correct? I mean, everybody agrees with that. The, uh, and uh, let me note that our, my, our colleague, Ms. Edwards, uh, who I deeply respect uh, from Maryland, I wish she was here now, uh, talked about the EPA's responsibility for public health and environment. Well, most of the people who support this idea that we're going to do something about uh, the CO2, the sequestration and the source sequestration, are thinking that it is a being done, it's a pollutant, and they're doing this in the name of protecting health. Now, am I correct that, uh, I haven't gone through a number of hearings, that CO2 is not a threat to public health? That it, and and uh, is, does the panel agree with that? CO2 does not affect human beings uh, as w in, in the process of producing electricity. Is that correct? Is there some some disagreement on that? I've been through many panels on this now. You'd be the first one. So uh, CO2 is not toxic, but it but the the temperature increases associated with greenhouse well, gases. Well, that's that's a different matter. Okay, so CO2 okay. is not toxic. It is not a pollutant. But we're going to spend a lot more money on it because we have the global warming theory that basically CO2 will affect the climate of the planet. But most of the people in, in the public who are looking for more, uh, uh, who are looking at expenses now, especially when we're in this deficit, they're, they're actually operating under the thought that what's happening with sequestration, et cetera, is being done to protect their health. Well, that just isn't the case. That's not the case, what we've just heard. It's based on a world climate theory, not on a personal health uh, uh, concept that we have to protect people's health. Uh, let me just note that what we have just heard with, a, uh, with the talks from Mr. Massey is that not only is uh, this whole sequestration not being done in order to protect public health, but by his questioning, he made it clear, and, I, and, I, and I, from what your answers were, that it's actually detrimental to the public health because you are increasing the level, uh, uh, the amount of sulfur, mercury, uh, and other particulates, et cetera, that are going into the air, because you now you are actually... Will, will the gentleman yield? Yes, I certainly will. And I'll give you some extra time. Unless the end goal is to do away with the coal industry, I'll yield back. All right. Well, I, I think that uh, sometimes people are not up, totally up front uh, about what their end goals are, but we, we have to look at the policies they're advocating today. But I would say that what we've heard at this hearing today indicates that the administration is rushing forward full steam ahead on this CO2 uh, sequestration as, as part of the uh, energy production of the United States in a way that will actually damage public health, but is consistent with their goal of trying to have a policy that affects the climate of the entire world, which I might add uh, is a very questionable theory and is gaining more skeptics every day on that theory. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, and I th thank the witnesses for being here today, and that concludes. I just I, um, thank you very much for yielding for just a moment. There were some documents that were introduced today at the hearing that we uh, did not see before. Staff was not given ahead of time. And I would like to request that all staff r remind members that it's helpful to get those ahead of time so that we can raise appropriate objections, if any. So I just wanted to put that reminder on the record that it is important for us to see the documents ahead of time rather than for the first time at a, at a hearing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Bonamici. appreciate that. And with that, this hearing is concluded. Thank <laughs> you.